passage. We're in Genesis chapter 32. If you brought a Bible along, you may want to open it up. I'm going to do that myself to Genesis chapter 32. If you've got a Bible app on your phone, feel free. We're the church that says it's good to have your cell phone out during the service. So here's what we've learned so far about Jacob. And for those of you who haven't been here, I'm just going to do a quick review of what we've, what we've heard so far. We've heard that Jacob was named Jacob because that name means heel grabber or deceiver. And he was given that name because he literally came out of his mother's womb grabbing the heel of his older brother, older twin, actually, Esau. From, from that point on, we see Jacob live out this name. From ambitiously trying to grab the family inheritance by serving his brother Esau a porridge when Esau's super, super hungry after coming in from the field, uh, to Jacob uh, literally dressing up like his brother and acting like his brother so that his father Isaac would bless him instead of Esau. We've seen uh, Jacob for 20 years living in Haran, the land of his extended family, and struggling with a whole family of heel grabbers and deceivers. You see, what we've learned, if we've learned anything about Jacob, is that Jacob was a fixer. And by fixer, I mean if he saw a problem, he confidently thought to himself, it's up to me. And for Jacob... The end frequently justified the means. It didn't matter how he went about fixing the problem as long as he got the result that he wanted. We see that. He's willing to cheat and lie and deceive to get the result that he wants because he's a fixer. I think it's important for us to see this quality in Jacob, and I'll tell you why. If you do any study of American culture, one of the top things that you're going to hear about us as a culture is that we are a whole nation of fixers. Now, for some of us, the end doesn't always justify the means. Our character, the character that God has built into us will prevent us from that kind of thinking, but I'll tell you, even for those of us who have the character that doesn't think the end justifies the means, it's still pretty hard to rid ourselves of the thought when we face a problem or a challenge or an issue in life, it's all up to me, I better get on this and fix it right away. That's how we are. That's what we believe built America. And so... Most of us see that as a highly desirable quality in a person, to take the initiative, to be an explorer, an adventurer, to be self-reliant, to handle. Like if I can say, I handle my own business, that's usually considered to be a pretty good quality. But what we're gonna see today is that the Bible takes a little bit different tack, and you might be surprised to hear that based on the fact that maybe you too have been taught by your parents, by people around you, handle your own business. And what we're gonna see is that through very short moments in Jacob's life, and also through sometimes some very extended times where God just drips, 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 change, into Jacob's heart, what God is doing is fixing Jacob's I'm a fixer mentality. And maybe some of us need that fixing as well, and I would guess that God is already working on our, on our hearts. Let me tell you a story that illustrates this. So there was a, a gentleman uh, named Scott Rudd, and uh, just about two weeks ago, he had to get to work. He lives in Jersey City, wants to get to work in New York City, and he was at the end of the month, and he didn't have enough money to get across to his job on time, on the ferry, 
just didn't have the cash to be able to do that. But he's a paddleboarder. So being a fixer, Scott said, I'll put on my suit. I'll pack my computer in my backpack, sling it over my back. Brought his stand-up paddleboard to the Hudson River. Got on the paddleboard and started paddling his way across the Hudson River. Now imagine this. This is, this is not easy to do. Even Scott himself said, a couple times I thought I was going to be swamped. But here's the unbelievable truth. You can read this story for yourself. Scott got all the way across the river safely, did not get dunked even once. And that story went wild on the internet. Why? Because Scott's a fixer. He took care. He even made it to his meeting on time that morning. And that's, we love that. We admire that. So here's what I'm going to tell you. As we learn to sort of give up some of our attitude that we must be fixers, this is a lifelong struggle. Lifelong struggle. And I'm also not saying that God doesn't equip us. We'll see that God at times equips us to be the answer to the prayers that we speak. I'm not suggesting that if you're a farmer, just say prayers to God and then don't do anything. I'm not saying that if you're a businessman, pray to God and then have a long, long lunch and that's your whole day. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying it's about your heart and your mind. You may work even harder once you learn what Jacob learned. But you will learn to work harder from a different space. And that's what we're talking about this morning. So I want you to write this down. A relationship with God, this is what Jacob discovers, will give you great peace. But there's an irony here. Because of our nature as sinners to want to fix everything ourselves, it's also going to be a lifelong struggle to let go and let God be in control and hand things over to him and let him solve problems for, for, for us, to let him be the capital F fixer of our lives. So, this is, this is the irony of the Christian faith, One, something a lot of people don't necessarily get or understand. You become a Christian, you get immense peace in your heart as you lean into Jesus and his love and his promises. You also get to enter into a huge battle every day as you learn to turn things over to God. So let's, let's start with the peace. I want to start with that part. What are some of the things that God gives us because he loves us? Phil just talked about God's love for us. What are some of the things that God gives you that you can bank on and rely on and know, hey, God's got this. If there's a phrase that I want you to go home with today, a phrase that you can especially use in your struggles and your challenges, is just this little short phrase. You might want to write it down. God's got this. God's got this. That's what Jacob had to learn. So, What's, what's one of the first things that we can look at? Let's, let's dive into Genesis chapter 32. Jacob is on his way to meet his brother. He has not seen Esau in 20 years. The last time he saw Esau, Esau was threatening to kill him. So you have to understand that context. Jacob doesn't know what the state of Esau's mind or heart is. For all Jacob knows, that last statement, I'm going to kill him as soon as I get the earliest opportunity, still applies. So I don't know if you've ever been to a meeting where you were just so anxious about the meeting, maybe at your work, maybe a, a talk that you knew you needed to have with your wife or your children, maybe a little conversation you needed to have with your neighbor about something that he's doing. And you were headed into that meeting with a lot of anxiety about how's this going to turn out, what's going to happen here. That's what Jacob's going through. Jacob also went on his way, and the angels of God met him. When, when Jacob saw them, he said, this is the camp of God. 
So he named that place Mahanaim. If there was ever understatement in the Bible, this has got to be the prime example. Oh yeah, Jacob was just on his way and two armies of angels met him. Ho-hum. That's kind of how it sounds. But we see this happen in the Bible over and over again where God sends angels when people are in certain trying circumstances to strengthen them, let them know they're protected, let them know that God is providing. We saw it earlier in Jacob's own life at Bethel where Jacob saw a ladder or a stairway with angels ascending and descending on it. God's message to that then and now is, Jacob, I've got this, and I got lots of help to help me get this. Truth number one, if you want to have peace in your heart, God's got this, and often he is going to get this using just natural means. We're going to see something that Jacob does in a, in a moment that is sort of trying to make sure he deals with his own fears. Nothing wrong with what he does. In fact, you might say God gave him some insight so that he could create a little plan and deal with his fears and what was happening with his brother Esau. But we're also going to see that we can trust that God will serve and protect us if necessary, supernaturally, not just naturally. And one of the lessons of this account of Jacob's life is, Jacob, if you need supernatural help in this situation, I've got plenty of supernatural help. Now, some of you have gone through things where you thought to yourself, I think I just saw, like I didn't see the angels, but I think I saw the effect of what they're doing. You've been in an accident and your life was protected, and your car was prevented from going into oncoming traffic, or something happened, and you said to yourself, oh my goodness, that was not natural, that was supernatural. God was at work, and his angels were working overtime today. What I'm telling you is, we don't often see this. And as frequently as we see maybe God do something like this in the Bible, there are also, even in the Bible, long stretches of time where God is at work supernaturally, but we don't necessarily hear accounts of that. That's true in your life too. And so truth number one, you can say God's got this because God is going to serve you. He loves you. He's your father, and he's going to protect you naturally if necessary, but also supernaturally if necessary. So write this down. God sends his angels to serve and protect me. And that's exactly what they're designed to do. Look at Hebrews 1.14. It says, are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? Now let's switch over a little bit to the natural side because God definitely uses what we might call natural means to be on our side, help us, serve us, and protect us. And one of those ways that he does is he gives us wisdom and insight, starting, by the way, right here. Why do we at Crosswalk Church frequently, maybe some would say constantly, Reinforce the idea to be in your scriptures every day. Number one, because God himself works supernaturally in the power of the Holy Spirit through this book. We know this from what the book itself tells us. We know this from our own experience. Number two, this book gives us the kind of wisdom. Read, for example, through the book of Proverbs. And, and for those of you who might want to have just a, a good place to start reading, now it's, it's a lot of collected verses, single verses of wisdom. You'll want to take it slow. Proverbs is not a bad way to start because it gives you immense wisdom and insight for your life. What Jacob knows here is he better do something and he's going to need some insight. So look at what happens next. When the messengers returned to Jacob, they said... 
We went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. Now, what do you think is Jacob's first thought when he hears that? My brother is still holding a grudge. I have to believe he's thinking that. Otherwise, why 400 men? It must look an awful lot like his brother Esau is bringing overwhelming force to bear. Jacob doesn't have this kind of force to fight back with. So, Jacob's afraid. We hear it right here. Verse 7. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him into two groups, and the flocks and the herds and the camels as well. So he's separating them. Later on, he's going to separate them even further and send them in five waves. And so he's saying, if I can't win, I better give some thought to how I'm going to run and how at least some of us are going to get away. That's what he's doing here. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. So write this down. God grants insight to handle tough situations wisely. Look, if you are facing overwhelming force, the smartest thing in the world to do is to say, I, I don't have the means to fight this. I better have another plan. And that's what Jacob is doing here. And so very wisely, he's figuring out if, if these 400 guys are a war party, not a welcoming party, we better figure out how to run and run fast. Where in your life do you need insight? Where in life do you need to get God's thoughts on what's coming up? Where in life are you facing what you might think overwhel are overwhelming odds? And, and you're feeling great fear and distress like Jacob is. One of, the, one of the most powerful pieces of the gospel is to know that God, your Father, wants to help you. And that's why he gave us this beautiful book with all of its promises so that in those promises, those promises are like those hooks in the Velcro. And, and we can take the loops of our heart and attach them to the loops of the Velcro and find solace and peace and comfort and know that if Christ was willing to go all the way to the cross for me, bleed and die for me, rise from the dead for me, I can attach myself to those hooks those beautiful promises of love. And I can find wisdom in the Bible so that I can know how to move forward. Guys, one of the reasons that we have growth groups here at Crosswalk is so that you can get other Christians around you, others who have hooked themselves into God's promises. If you're trying to do things on your own in great fear and distress, not knowing how to solve a problem. Can I just ask you a simple question? Why are you doing that on your own? Why are you not tapping into other people here at your very own church family who love you and want to protect you from Satan and, and, from, and from loss, who want to help you? And, and get yourself around other people Growth groups is a fantastic way to do that. Ministry teams is a great way to do that. Because as you serve together, you start to get to know each other. And as you get to know each other, you build friendship and trust, and you start talking to one another, and, and you begin to feel comfortable to be a little bit more transparent, a little bit more open. So I just want to encourage you on this. God has great insight. You access it here. You access it in places like your growth group and your ministry team. Let's move on. Third reason why we can know we, we have peace in God's love. Then Jacob prayed, O God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord, you who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives, and I will make you prosper, I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you have shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan. But now I have become two camps. 
Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. But you have said, will you underline that phrase? You have said, I will surely make you prosper and will make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. Those words are so critical. You have said. What, first of all, though, what's Jacob doing here? What's he doing? Then Jacob prayed. To whom? O God of my father Abraham. The God that my father Abraham worshipped. The God that my father uh, Isaac worshipped. And then he quotes God. You ever had somebody do that? You're, if you're a teacher... Or, or you're a boss, or you're a dad, and all of a sudden, you know, one of your kids comes up and quotes you? Oh, yeah, I said that, didn't I? That's what Jacob is doing here, right? He's praying, and he's saying, Father, didn't you say this? And why did I have you underline, save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother, Esau and but you have said. Here's why. This is the pivotal point where we really see Jacob say, you know what? I can't fix everything. I may be by nature a fixer. I may be someone who just loves to handle stuff, not need anyone or anything outside of myself, but I've come to the end of my rope, God. I'm done with being the fixer. I need you to be the fixer because you have said I can grab hold of those hooks called your promises. See, God gives us prayer so that we can respond to the great wisdom and insight we get here, great promises we get here, and say to God, God, I'm done with myself. I want to come back to you. And I want you to be the fixer. And that's exactly what Jacob is doing here. This is a beautiful prayer. If I had more time, I'd take you into how Jacob, but you do this. This can be a little bit of homework for yourself. Take this home and ask yourself, how does Jacob handle this prayer? What, what does he say? What does he do? If you are not familiar with prayer and you want to have a great model for what prayer should look like, because I don't have time to get into it today, but you can figure it out. Take this home, look at this prayer, and you will learn how to be a better prayer from the way Jacob prays here. So turn the page. Notice, notice what James says before you turn it. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let's say these last three words together. Is anyone among you in trouble? Let them pray. All right, turn it over. Here's your fill-in. God gives me prayer so I can hand my fears to him. So, beautiful truths to give you peace. Number one, God is going to help serve and protect you naturally and even supernaturally through his angels if need be. Truth number two, God is going to, through his word and his promises, give you the insight and the wisdom you need to take part in the solution of your problems. And then finally, God is going to, God has bought you the most beautiful cell phone you'll ever earn. It's an invisible cell phone, but you should use it. And you should talk to God. No, let's get rid of should. We get to talk to God. We get to talk to God and lay anything we want before him. And he is the loving father of all of us and the God of the universe. So who wouldn't want to use that cell phone? So, first part, you become a Christian. You get, there is so much peace. And by the way, I know a lot of times people think when you become a Christian, this is all dramatic and it's emotional. Can I tell you, I'm not, I mean, I'm dramatic and emotional, but in all the wrong ways. Like, if I get frustrated and angry, you'll see me dramatic and emotional. 
I wish sometimes I had a little bit more of that emotional side that responded to God's promises. And, you know, as you sometimes see people do, they, they just feel and cry. I mean, like, for me, it's not like that. Maybe it's not like that for you either. That doesn't mean you don't have faith. It, it simply means you can have faith and be a Christian and go, God's got amazing promises of love for me, and I'm going to live in them. It's far more important than you, that you get yourself connected to those hooks. Whether it's emotional for you or not to believe God's promises, just connect to those hooks and live your life as if they're truly true, those promises. That's what God is looking for. Now, I, I said this earlier, and we're going to wrap up by saying this. You get great peace when you become a believer. You also enter a great battle, a great struggle. And we're going to see that. Jacob's going to wrestle with God. That night, Jacob got up. So he, he is just about the next day going to finally meet his brother. He got up and he took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons and crossed the fort of the Jabbok. If you want to get a picture in mind of what this looks like, uh, if you've ever been tubing down the Salt River, uh, there are places on the Jabbok that look a lot like the Salt River. So you can kind of picture that's what it looks like, okay? How many of you have been tubing? Come on now. We need to get, you know what? We've got to have a crosswalk tubing day. There's not enough of us. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions, so Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. So this is, we've had some weird stuff. Ask me to explain exactly how this is going down. I don't know. Phil told you earlier this is the, the pre-incarnate Christ. It is the pre-incarnate Christ because he's going to say, I just wrestled with God. So Jacob was left alone. A man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. And the man said, let me go, for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Even that question tells you who Jacob is wrestling with here. The man asked him, what's your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you've struggled with God. Underline those words, struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he, this man, truly Christ, replied, why do you ask my name? And then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying it is because I saw God face to face and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip because the socket of Jacob's hip was touched near the tendon. The Son of God comes while Jacob is trying to get some quiet time all alone, gather his thoughts. He's still got great fear in his heart. He doesn't know how this meeting with Esau and the 400 soldiers are gonna go the next year. This is a stressful, talk about anticipatory anxiety. Jacob's got that in spades. And so he's like, okay, I gotta gather my thoughts. He sends everyone away. He's gathering and all of a sudden in the dark comes this guy whom Jacob thinks at first is a man, and they just start wrestling. It's, it's, it's throwdown time. And they're wrestling, and they're wrestling, and at, at one point it says he touches the socket of Jacob's hip. Now, I don't know if you've ever thrown your shoulder out. How's that feel? Painful, let me just tell you. Your hip is a much larger joint. If your hip gets injured or inflamed in the tendon or whatever it was, it's excruciatingly painful. Jacob knows, I'm not going to win. I can't solve my own problems, and I can't, 
I can't beat this guy, but it's becoming clear this is not a natural event. It's a supernatural event. This is God himself I'm wrestling with. And so Jacob makes one determination in this. I can't win, but I can hang on. I don't care how painful it is. I, 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 don't, I don't care what else happens. He is not going to make me let go until he blesses me. If you want a lesson for yourself out of Jacob's story of wrestling with God is because you want to be self-reliant, because Jacob wanted to be self-reliant, because I want to be self-reliant, it's a lifelong struggle to give up control and to let God be in the driver's seat of your life, to truly trust his love that much. And I'm telling you to trust his love that much when you're in pain, like Jacob was, that's taking it to a whole nother level. To trust God when he's facing a meeting like he's facing the next day, that's taking it to a whole nother level. Because how do you know whether or not you're trusting yourself to be the fixer or God to be the fixer? Times of testing, times of challenge, times of pain. If in those times you can just say, God, I'm Velcroing myself to the hooks of your promises and I am not letting go. That's what God is teaching us today. You may be able to do absolutely nothing, just like Jacob was able to do absolutely nothing, except for hang on to God's love and God's grace and God's forgiveness. Look, we've all done things that we're horribly ashamed of. We've all done things that we carry guilt for from today. If you're anything like my family was when we were going to church, we were fighting all the way to church and then put on the smile and go, good morning. Yesterday you did some stuff. Last week, last year, last decade. But God's promises to you is that has all been put in the dumpster through this great exchange of God giving his life, Jesus Christ giving his life on the cross so that we could have his forgiveness and his righteousness. This is truth. And it's truth that you can bank on and cling to and stick to. Whatever challenges in life you're facing, hang on to God and his love. Whatever pain you have in your life, Whatever you're anxious about, hang on to God and his beautiful promises. Just let yourself, let your heart be those little loops clinging to the hooks of his love for you. Here's the last verse. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Just, just as, as Jacob does here, just surrender. Give up trying to be the fixer. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. So write this in. To find my life, I will lose it and stick to Jesus Christ. Last point. Please understand this. If you want to lose your life and give up the whole idea of fixing everything yourself, expect that to be a lifelong process just as it was for Jacob. It's going to be that way for you too. And you're going to waver back and forth. Okay, sometimes I'm ready to give it all to God and sometimes, man, I'm like, God, let me take it back. Let God keep working on your heart and just stick to his love and promises. Let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, it's so clear today that you want us to teach us not just to be better people or to live transformed lives. You want to transform our hearts first. You want to transform our hearts so that we become less and less independent and fixing everything ourselves and living that stressful life where we got to rush and drive. You want to just say to us, 
Would you lean into me? Would you trust my love? Would you believe my promises to me? To, to, would you believe my promises to you? you? That's what you're saying to us today, Lord. And I pray for the people in this room that, that we would. We would say, Lord, I, I give up. I'm ready to lose my life, lose my attitude of I gotta fix everything and give it to you and let you for once and maybe even for always be the one who through your love and promises fixes my heart and helps me in life. Lord, your son Jesus tells us if we do that, we not only get a life filled with peace here, we get eternal life based in your forgiveness and in your sacrifice on the cross. Help us to believe that and live it, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.